George Galloway, and the mother of all talk shows. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. We are considering it, says Joe Biden in the Rose Garden when asked about the impending decision on whether or not to continue with the proceedings against the whistleblower, truth teller, the world's greatest publisher, Julian Assange. Although having reviewed the video now myself, I'm wondering if he misheard and thought someone was asking him if he was on his way to the toilet. And as Israel murders the three sons and three grandchildren of Hamas leader Ismail Haniya, the Western governments appear to have recovered their confidence, shaken in the wake of the killing of seven foreign aid workers in Gaza and have begun doubling down in support of the genocide and arming it along with it. It's all coming up over the next two hours on the mother of all talk shows. So fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway. The world is our classroom. And you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. Well, it may turn out to be a where were you at the moment that you heard that the long saga of Julian Assange's persecution by the governments of the Western world, the participants in war after war, crime after crime, were considering dropping the case against the world's greatest publisher, the world's biggest political prisoner, although he's a political prisoner invisible in the country in which he's being held. No media, none ever concentrates on the fact that in a dungeon in London, the world's most famous journalist, most famous publisher is incarcerated now for well over a decade. But you may come to remember today as a red letter day. The Australian parliament and government have asked the United States and the UK to halt proceedings against Julian Assange and to set him free after well over a decade of one form of incarceration or another. The Rose Garden has been the scene of many important announcements and this one may turn out to be the latest. Joe Biden was shuffling along as is his want uh, in the Rose Garden, in the pathway, and someone shouted from the journalistic crowd, have you a response to the Australian request for the dropping of the proceedings against Assange? Without looking, Biden, still shuffling, merely said, we are considering it. Now, on the face of it, that might be a very auspicious statement indeed. Although, as I joked earlier, he might have misheard. He might have thought he was being asked if he needed to go to the lavatory, as is his want, oftentimes during the day. And if he can't make it, as in the case of the Pope, he just does it there and then. It may be, though, that the long calvary of Julian Assange is coming to an end. If so, the compensation will have to be mighty big. Julian Assange has been metaphorically nailed to a cross almost all of the years. In fact, all of the years, bar one month, that I have known him, and that is a very long time indeed. Julian Assange was falsely imprisoned, falsely accused. His extradition, first to Sweden and then to the United States, was falsely pursued. Sir Keir Starmer was one of the falsifiers. Sir Keir Starmer, the next Prime Minister, one presumes, certainly he presumes, uh, of the, the United Kingdom, when Director of Public Prosecution, 
egged on the Swedish prosecutors in their attempt to extradite Julian on entirely fake, bogus rape and other sexual assault charges. This is no time to go weak, he said. Hold your nerve. Keep it up. It was an entirely contrived set of circumstances, from accusation to the process itself. Fearing extradition to Sweden, from which he would have been promptly extradited to the United States for the real uh, offence that he is said to have committed, namely telling the truth about war crimes in Afghanistan and Iraq, revealing to the public the kind of crimes that were routinely being committed by their own governments. That was his real crime, the crime of journalism. He was effectively accused of journalism. And that's why they wanted him in Sweden. That's why they wanted to extradite him onwards to the United States. So he took refuge in the embassy of Ecuador in central London, just behind the Harrods uh, flagship store in London's Knightsbridge. The long period cooped up in that tiny room, in that tiny embassy, don't be misled by the word embassy, it was a ground floor flat in a mansion building in central London, one tiny part of which was occupied by Julian Assange, where he received many visitors from around the world, including me, my wife, and some of my children. We thought that he might be there for some considerable time because we were unsure that the United States would ever have a government that would either drop the intention to extradite him or even pardon him. We thought that in the case of Donald Trump, he might drop the charges. He might pardon Julian, though nothing in the end came to pass on that. It's my understanding that the deep state in the United States threatened, blackmailed Donald Trump, that if he were to pardon Julian Assange, he himself would pay the price. And at that point in time, Trump already had plenty on his plate. And then Joe Biden continued the Calvary. He continued the persecution. A Democratic president continued to try and extradite and send to a hanging jury in Virginia, the world's greatest journalist. I said many times on this show that I could not see how that could possibly be in Joe Biden's interest. It would lose him even more of the support already dwindling amongst a certain caste of people in the United States. It would create a cause celebre in the heart of an election year if he had to deal with a journalist in chains coming down the stairs of an aircraft from London and then seeing that journalist put on trial a swift and entirely unjust trial, few have any doubt. I argued for a long time that the best thing for Biden, the best thing for the Democrats, and of course, coincidentally, the best thing for the world would be for the United States to drop these charges. We'll be talking to two men who have been intimately involved in this case right from the beginning, Chris Hedges and the Honorable Craig Murray, about this story later in the show. Today, on Eid Day, having slaughtered 14 children overnight, Israel slaughtered several more in the beach camp in Gaza. Six of their victims were the children and grandchildren of the Hamas leader, Ismail Hania, a man I have met. These children lived in the refugee camp, as indeed did Hania, before getting out of the country and heading for Qatar, where he now lives. His children stayed behind in the refugee camp, and their children with them. They were driving an ordinary car in the beach camp today 
when a carefully targeted strike from the Israeli occupation army took them all out in one go. In a blaze, six of the issue of Ismail Haniya were destroyed. I've seen the pictures of where he was visiting wounded people in Qatar, where they'd been flown for medical attention when he got the call on speakerphone that his children and grandchildren had been murdered by the Israeli armed forces. To say he was a picture of serenity and acceptance and submission and courage would be a severe understatement. He immediately responded uh, with the words that his children were not more valuable than the other children that had been slaughtered in Gaza. He went on to say that all of the children who had been slaughtered were his children too. He went on to thank God for his children and grandchildren being placed on the pathway to heaven, arising out of their father's struggle for the liberation of the Palestinian territory and in particular the Al-Aqsa Mosque. He thanked God for this martyrdom. He said that it would make no difference to the struggle for Palestine's liberation and surely it will not. I'm not sure of the thought process that went into the decision to murder the family of Ismail Haniya, a man that Israel is right this minute negotiating with through third parties in Cairo for a ceasefire for the release of hostages and for a temporary at least end to this particular chapter of the conflict. I'm not sure if they were doing it deliberately to wreck the negotiations, to make sure that none of their own hostages were to be freed and to come home freely to speak about what happened to them, who it was that sheltered them, who it was that tried to kill them. I'm not sure if it was a deliberate act by Netanyahu himself or by elements in the armed forces were determined to stop any kind of deal being reached in Cairo. I'm not sure that there's anybody in the Israeli leadership stupid enough to believe that killing his children and grandchildren is going to make Ismail Haniya give up the struggle to liberate Palestine. I'm not sure if there's anybody in Israel stupid enough to believe that this will make Hamas less popular in Gaza than the are at this point in time killing children and grandchildren who could easily have escaped and could easily, like the son of Netanyahu, be living in five-star luxury in a hotel somewhere way, way offshore, but chose instead to remain in their hovel in a refugee camp where they could be killed at any moment in time, either deliberately targeted or not. I'm not sure if there's any idiot in Israel who thinks Hamas is weakened by this act of mass murder of children uninvolved in any of the politics, any of the armed struggle against occupation. These were civilians. These were uninvolved family members. I'm not sure if Israel consulted its allies including Joe Biden, as to whether this particular strike would help or hinder his re-election, which more than ever before now hinges on a scaling down of America's overseas wars, which are now so unpopular that scarcely 20% of those who would normally vote Democrat support his policy of arming and protecting Israel over these last six months. I'm not sure if there's anybody there who was consulted who may not want Joe Biden to be re-elected. All of these things are up in the air. 
as are the missiles, the bombs, the rockets, the warplanes, the warships, the tanks on the ground, the heavy artillery just across the line now that the Israeli forces have withdrawn from the theater itself, they are raining down death and destruction on unprecedented numbers of entirely defenseless civilian men, but mainly women and children. This ghastly, obscene, horrific series of massacres will live forever. And I thought last week that we were on the verge, not least because the British government briefed the British press to the effect that Sunak was going to tell Netanyahu that Britain had concluded that Israel was committing war crimes in Gaza and that it would therefore be impossible for the British government to continue selling weapons and participating in intelligence collaboration with a military action which they had legal advice to the effect was breaking war crime and prohibition of crimes against humanity and potentially even the ultimate crime of genocide. That's what we were led to believe the British government were going to do following the horrific murder of seven foreign aid workers, three of them British military veterans who were systematically, deliberately murdered by Israel just a week or so ago. But they've recovered their bottle. They've recovered their confidence. David Cameron said today that Britain will not be halting arms sales to Netanyahu's regime. Blinken and Austin and one American spokesman after another stated incredibly that they had seen no evidence that Israel was involved in the crime of genocide, presumably meaning they have no mobile telephone, have no computer, have no television at home or in the office because the rest of the world has seen it in blood red technicolor for six months and more. So the Americans and the British are doubling down in support of this genocide. Britain's arms contribution is in quantum quite small. It's nothing like as big as the arms sales of Germany to Israel, which have increased tenfold over the last six months, ten times greater than they were the previous year. The government of Nicaragua, to its eternal credit, has mounted a powerful case this week before the International Court of Justice that Germany too is complicit in the crime of genocide by not just arming but exponentially increasing the number of weapons, shells and other military hardware that it has provided for Netanyahu to conduct these crazed, unhinged, genocidal massacres. I don't know what the ICJ verdict will be. I'm no longer even sure that it will be worth the paper that it's written on in any case. Because I'm so old, I remember that very same ICJ sending Israel for trial plausibly, their word, accused of genocide. I'm so old I remember the ICJ ordering Israel, ordering them to halt, cease and desist a long list of things that they were demonstrably doing on the basis that they would compound the crime of genocide 
on which they were sending Israel for trial, declaring that Israel had a case to answer on South Africa's charges that they had crossed the threshold and were now involved in the ultimate crime of genocide. But Germany and Britain and the United States governments are all acting against the express wishes of the vast majority of their own people, who in ever-increasing massive majorities demand a ceasefire now, an end to the occupation now, and a Palestinian state now. The fact that governments in Western countries can so ignore the vast majority of their own people proves overwhelming that, boy, do you live in some kind of democracy. We've got some great guests tonight. It's going to be the mother of all talk shows. George, I'm just looking at another dimension in this uh, Gaza war conflict. Could this be a religious conflict in the guise of it's not Islam versus Christianity versus Judaism, but an ideology, a, a Zionist ideology in establishing their leader that is supposed to come in, in the future and they will then govern and rule? It's in their ideology, for sure. The Zionists are uh, no more and no less than a nationalist ideology. They are nothing whatsoever to do with religion. Anybody who thinks Netanyahu is religious hasn't looked too closely into his private life. These people are extreme nationalists, exceptionalists. Some Americans believe in American exceptionalism. Zionists believe in Jewish exceptionalism. Nobody in truth is exceptional. There's nothing religious about it. It's about land. It's about nationalist supremacy, ethno-religious supremacy on the land of Palestine. And the Europeans colonized Palestine in the same way that the Europeans colonized South Africa. So fitting, the victims of white European colonialism are coming to the aid of other victims of white European colonialism and they're doing the whole world a signal service. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Well, we have a poll running as always. Will Israel now attack Lebanon? Yes or no? Well, they're already attacking Lebanon every day and have uh, displaced thousands of people already. I suppose the poll means, will there now be a full-scale war uh, between Israel and Lebanon? You can vote yes or no on my telegram, t.me forward slash George Galloway, on my Twitter or X, on the YouTube community poll or on the YouTube stream. If you're watching us on the YouTube stream or on Facebook, or on any platform that allows you to do so, please share right now with all your friends and uh, contacts. If you want to call the show, it's toll-free in the United States and Canada. Here's the number. Plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. If you're in the UK or Ireland, equally free of charge, it's 0808 196 If you're in the rest of the world, it's 442039662625. Now, Tucker Carlson lifted the veil this week that has been covering up the state of Christianity, Christians, their churches, and their communities in the Holy Land of Palestine. It's remarkable, one of the most remarkable things in all history that the vast majority of professed Christians in the United States of America are amongst the most virulent supporters of the Zionist state of Israel. I know, I don't understand it either. But Tucker Carlson 
lifted the veil this very week when he interviewed one solitary Christian pastor from Bethlehem. You wouldn't have thought that would have caused too much of a stir in a religious country like the United States, but boy, has it. Let's go to our resident professor in Florida, Simon, on this very topic. Simon, he's put the cat amongst the pigeons, hasn't he? Uh, certainly amongst the Zionist pigeons, that's for sure. And um, he interviewed this pastor by the name of Isaac Munster for, from an evangelical Lutheran church in Bethlehem of all places. And he made it um, very, very clear that um, the Christians are not being treated well by the Jewish authorities, either in the occupied territories or indeed in the um, parts of old Jerusalem, where there's currently a very, very hard campaign underway to expel all of the Armenians from some of their properties. And the Armenian patriarch has been um, very, very public about that and putting out international calls for assistance. Now, this interview, much like your show, has been watched by millions of people. But in fact, it's been watched by 12 million people in under 24 hours. And the Christian Zionists in America are literally freaking out because it's really calling their hypocrisy um, very much to the attention of the public. Now, what's particularly important to remember here is the average age of that Christian Zionist population in the United States. They tend to be more elderly and they tend to have very high electoral participation. So whilst the Democrats have been losing the liberal Jews and also the younger members of their party. They don't tend to vote in not nearly such high percentages. So if we see a significant shift in the American viewpoint and so even more people starting to use the phrase genocide, then this really is uh, a very telling point in America's relationship with the nation state of Israel. Whether or not they will um, be willing to drop the veto that they um, expressed again on Monday, they didn't use it, but they indicated in the press conference before the record short United Nations Security Council meeting, three minutes that passed the issue to the um, UN Admissions Committee that met briefly on Monday afternoon and are meeting again on Thursday against the wishes of the Russians who wanted the issue to be put to a vote immediately. But the Maltese president of the UN Security Council has said that any member of the Security Council can insist upon a vote being held immediately at any point. So we may not have to wait until the end of April. But this is all whilst we're seeing this visit from David Cameron in the United States. And indeed, after he met with President Trump, which apparently offended a lot of Democrats, he then went to the House of Representatives to try and meet with Speaker Johnson, who himself is an arch Zionist, and actually was given a personal tour of what he calls Judea and Samaria in 2020, February of 2020, by the current Israeli ambassador, to the United Nations, Mr. Erdan. You can see the level of his connections there. He was the head of the Judiciary Committee who's leading the impeachment proceedings against President Biden. That gentleman, Mr. Jordan, was on his seventh visit to the West Bank. So that's how deep some of the Christian Zionist connections are there. That individual, the Speaker of the American House of Representatives, refused to meet with David Cameron. Well, I'd refuse to meet him. Well, actually, I wouldn't, but I'd be very lucky to see him. The Americans have seen far more of him, Simon, than the British parliamentarians have, because, of course, we have literally not looked upon his face since he was appointed as our foreign secretary. Go figure, as the Americans say. Simon, thanks very much for that.
Let's go now to uh, an American Christian gentleman, a man of very great merit and honor indeed. Chris Hedges, the broadcaster, writer, analyst, and host of the Chris Hedges Report. It's always a privilege, Chris, to have you on the mother of all talk shows. Before we turn to the Tucker Carlson uh, affair uh, with the Reverend uh, Munter, uh, let's uh, talk about the breaking news first. Uh, Joe Biden appears to be considering dropping the charges against your friend and mine, Julian Assange. What's your take on that? Biden has so many uh, difficulties now in the upcoming presidential election with eroding support. Uh, I'm certain he doesn't need or want to add the persecution of Julian Assange to it. Remember, we have had, as in Great Britain, we have had uh, not only constant protests over the genocide in Gaza, uh, but I think what has spooked the Democratic Party and the Biden administration is that these protests have not abated, not only in terms of uh, frequency, but in terms of size. So they definitely don't want to uh, add to it. Uh, So yes, there's been talk of a plea deal, some kind of a clean out on a misdemeanor to possessing classified information. Uh, That's been in the works now for several weeks. So we have known that there has been interest on the part of the Biden administration in perhaps not extraditing Julian Assange, which is very, very good news if that happens, because as you know, once Julian Assange is in the clutches of the U.S. prison system uh, and the Eastern District Court of Virginia, uh, it's uh, a pretty bleak outlook for him ever getting out. Well, it's a a very tight timetable they're now working to uh, because the uh, British (laughs) High Court required uh, an answer assurances on three points uh, at its last hearing, and the United States must give those uh, very soon indeed. It can't be much more than 10 days away from now. They have to satisfy uh, the British court uh, on several points, but the most important one, it seemed to me, was that they would have to give an assurance uh, that Julian would be afforded First Amendment rights uh, in the in any subsequent proceedings in the United States. And it struck me immediately on reading that condition uh, that that would be a difficult one for the United States to concede. So perhaps it's in their interest uh, now to negotiate some kind of dropping of the main charges rather than have to refuse the British High Court the assurances that they are seeking. Well, it's interesting. I I sat through the trial. I was in the courtroom, and uh, we knew that there would be, uh, I mean, it's almost certain that the two panel of judges would allow an appeal because under repeated questioning, the prosecutors refused to offer assurances that one, Julian would not be subject to the death penalty, and two, that he would receive First Amendment protection. Uh, Now, maybe that was done intentionally, Uh, Gordon Kromberg, the chief prosecutor in the Eastern District Court of New York, has made public statements that Julian uh, will not receive First Amendment protection. Uh, So all they have to do is not offer those assurances, and Julian will most likely not be extradited or, or, or certainly will be allowed to appeal. Yes, uh, it would be better uh, if Joe Biden is right in this consideration. He then drops the charges. Then Julian can go free. If he's merely allowed further to appeal, uh, he continues in this uh, incredibly unjust persecution uh, in in Belmarsh jail. Right. Well, my guess is that this plea deal, which has been quietly in the works, is probably the exit. It's not a matter of dropping, well, it's a matter of dropping the most serious charges and having him plea out to a minor charge. I suspect that's the exit if there is one. Let me turn then, I don't know if you were able to hear us, I know you're on the move. Uh, We just were talking about the extraordinary 
Tucker Carlson interview, uh, which has been seen by 12 million people in less than 24 hours, uh, in which it seems to have come, uh, forgive the pun, as something of a revelation uh, to many of Carlson's audience uh, that there are Christians in Palestine, uh, surprise, surprise, <laughs> and that they are treated every bit as horrifically as the Muslims in occupied Palestine are. Has that taken you by surprise, the furor over this interview? I mean, it's an indication of how illiterate most of the public is vis-a-vis -vis Israel and the Palestinians. Uh, remember, we had a church uh, attacked and destroyed by the Israeli army in Gaza with Christians who were taking shelter in it killed. Uh, no, I mean, it's it, 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 on so many issues uh, dealing with the apartheid state of Israel and the ongoing genocide in Gaza, and I have to blame the media for this, the public has just been very, very ill-informed. And this is just one example of how the media has failed to do its job. Uh, so I, I wasn't surprised uh, because uh, of the uh, paucity of decent coverage with the exception of uh, alternative media or Al Jazeera. Uh, the, I mean, my old employer, the New York Times, remember they ran an editorial denouncing calls for a ceasefire. I mean, and then of course the whole uh, specious story about systematic sexual abuse, which turned out not to have any victims. Uh, so uh, I think it's an example of how ill-informed the public is and how the the, the media, the, the mainstream media, legacy media has failed to do its job. Uh, just, uh, I mean, of interest perhaps only to those of us in the same business, uh, how do you account for Tucker Carlson's uh, trajectory uh, towards being the man that raises this kind of thing. It's quite a surprise knowing what we do about Tucker, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Tucker Carlson, and of course that's why he's not on Fox anymore, is actually willing to grapple with issues uh, that uh, challenge the mainstream narrative, this being a good example. Uh, and I think that you do it all the time, I do it all the time, um, but he has a kind of uh, a megaphone or a perch uh, because he was came out of that legacy or establishment commercial media that, that you know, we don't have. Uh, and, but he's used it. I mean, he's used it in this case in a very positive way, um, but that's why he's no longer there. Now, I said earlier in my monologue that having been temporarily shaken uh, by the murder of the seven foreign aid workers, three of them British, one of them an American-Canadian, one Irish, I think, one German. Uh, having been temporarily shaken, where Western ministers, uh, your president, uh, were beginning to indicate that this was a, a red line, this was uh, the straw that broke the camel's back, that measures would have to be taken curbing arms sales and the rest. They seem to have recovered, these Western leaders, recovered their uh, bottle, as we say in Glasgow. Uh, and now they're doubling down again. Uh, there's going to be no ban on arms sales from Britain. Uh, Netanyahu is not going to be told by Rishi Sunak that Britain considers Israel to be committing war crimes, both of which were briefed uh, to the media by the British government. Uh, Austin today, uh, Blinken today, insisting that they have seen no evidence that Israel's committing uh, the crime of genocide. Uh, am I right in saying they've, they've recovered their confidence and doubling down? Yeah, completely. I mean, it's, it's farcical, these briefings about how Israel has not violated any international laws or the Leahy Act, uh, any of the acts that prohibit uh, indiscriminate use of U.S. weapons that are supplied to a foreign country, because, of course, if they admit it once, 
then the pipeline has to be turned off and it has to be investigated. So they're not going to do that. I think the outrage comes from the fact that World Central Kitchen was a uh, Trojan horse. It was set up uh, with the embrace of Israel and the United States to replace UNRWA. Uh, it can't, of course, it, it doesn't have the capacity, the logistical capacity to replace. This is the UN agency that supplies aid to Palestinians, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians, uh, uh, both within Gaza, the West Bank and the diaspora. I mean, probably well over a couple million. I don't know the exact number. Um, and so they had set up this uh, uh, entity as a way to uh, uh, justify the severing of funds to UNRWA uh, and create a situation by which UNRWA would be destroyed. Uh, the central, uh, the the, uh, the kitchen, the the global central kitchen doesn't have the capacity, doesn't have the trucks, doesn't have the drivers, doesn't have the infrastructure. Uh, in fact, Israel was going to handle the distribution. So uh, I think the outrage was over that they were working with the Israelis essentially in this subterfuge, and then the Israelis killed all seven aid workers in these trucks. So, I mean, one truck after the other. They were piling from one damaged vehicle to the next, and they were all gunned down by drones, probably operated by 19-year-old kids in some base outside of Tel Aviv. So I think that was where the outrage came, uh, but it was never going to translate into a severing of arms shipments. Now, uh, I'm sure you've caught the news uh, that uh, Ismail Haniyeh, the Hamas uh, chair of the Politburo of Hamas, three of his sons and three of his grandchildren were murdered today in what can only be a carefully targeted strike. Can't have been an accident. They were driving, driving in a small car, uh, making Eid family visits, and they were all murdered in, in, in a puff of smoke. And I was asking the question in my monologue, uh, does anyone, is there anyone in Washington, London, or in Tel Aviv uh, who imagines that this crime, on top of all the other crimes, can possibly contribute to anything good? What do you say? Well, this is the typical modus operandi of the Israeli army and has been for decades. They not only target Hamas leaders, resistance leaders, but they target their families. I knew Abdul Aziz Rantisi, pediatrician, one of the founders of Hamas. He was assassinated with his son. Uh, his wife was killed uh, probably on a targeted assassination at the beginning of this genocide. I knew his successor, both he and Sheikh Yassin were both killed and then Niza Rayan took over. They obliterated his family house with all of his children. I've been in the house, so with all of his children and his wife and everyone inside. So that's how they operate. They, there, there are no rules of engagement. Uh, if you are in any way, well, I mean, at this point, anyone in Gaza is a target. This is a war against Palestinians. But in this case, I think you're probably right. They were clearly targeted. Uh, that is the way they operate. That is the way they have always operated. Um, it is an absolutely appalling strategy because we're talking, of course, about children. Uh, it doesn't matter who their parents or grandparents are, uh, but that's how Israel works. I mean, when they go after a Hamas, a suspected Hamas militant in an apartment block, they'll take down the whole block. They can kill 100, 200 people up to uh in, to get one target and that's how they uh that's how that's how the idf works this is just normal yes but at this moment in time uh, we're told negotiations are at a critical stage in cairo uh, between the very same hamas albeit acting through well, a third party either qatar or, or egypt or both uh is this an attempt to wreck these negotiations, uh, in which case, does Israel really want its hostages to be returned? Are there people in Israel well, I, who I, don't I, want to see their hostages returned? Well, first of all, I, I suspect a fairly large number of those hostages at this point are no longer alive, uh, number one. Number two, uh, if 
the Netanyahu government wanted the hostages returned. He could have done it uh, the, on October 8th. Uh, all they had to do was create a ceasefire. There was hostages were taken in exchange for the thousands of Palestinian hostages, which include women and children, of course. Uh, there could have been a direct exchange. The Netanyahu government never wanted to do it. Uh, I think the families of the hostages in Israel have figured out that their hostages are being sacrificed. I see no good faith in these negotiations between uh, Israel and Hamas. Uh, so, uh, I, oh, but you're right. I mean, <laughs> this this will make that intractability more intractable, but I think it was pretty intractable to begin with. So what happens next, Chris, in your view? You're uh, long in the tooth in this area. You know the terrain, you know the political forces at work. Uh, is this going to continue for another six months, for another six years, at this level of intensity, or what? I think the intent is quite clear. I, I, I know the intent. I don't know the outcome. The intent is to create a humanitarian crisis of such catastrophic proportions that the Palestinians in Gaza have two choices, die or leave. They can die from smart bombs, 2,000-pound uh, bombs, uh, so-called dumb bombs. They can die from snipers. They can die from starvation. They can die from infectious disease. Uh, remember, there's no clean water. Uh, but th that's the, that's the, those are the options that Israel intends to lay out, and we're talking in a matter of weeks. Uh, Israel hopes that that humanitarian crisis, which of course they have engineered, let's never forget that there are thousands of aid trucks, uh, literally just a few kilometers from Rafah, uh, that the Israelis are not allowing into Gaza uh, to alleviate this crisis. Uh, and, uh, and they hope that that will put pressure on governments like the Sisi government in Egypt to uh, expel or deport these Palestinians. I mean, the pier itself, remember early on, the Israeli press uh, was reporting that there were feelers out to countries in Africa, Latin America, where in exchange for remuneration, would they take Palestinian uh, refugees? And where, how would those refugees be delivered? Well, they'd walk off a pier onto a boat. Uh, so that option is also open. That's clearly the intent. Um, I think as long as the United States and I see no sign that they will, the, continues, uh, to, if they won't hold arm shipments, and I see no sign that they will, as long as those arm shipments continue, I think about 68% of munitions Israel is using now comes from the United States stockpiles, uh, then that intent uh, becomes, uh, we, 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 we come closer and closer to seeing that intent realized. But that, that is, there's no question now as to uh, what Israel is doing and what it wants. The only question is whether the international community community will continue to be as supine as it is uh, to allow Israel to carry out this genocide. Lastly, and I'm grateful for your time, Chris, on what I know is a busy day for you. Uh, is Iran ever going to respond uh, to the attack on their embassy in Damascus? Should we be looking out? Are we expecting to wake up one morning and discover uh, some severe uh, retaliation, which will then presumably beget a further strike from Israel and more retaliation? Are we helter-skeltering into what's always described as the wider regional war? Well, Israel's pushing it. I think if we had to nominate a country that has practiced the most restraint at this point, it would probably be Iran or Hezbollah in Lebanon. Hezbollah does not want to see West Beirut flattened as it was in 1982 uh, by the Israelis. Uh, there has to be some kind of a response. Uh, they'll calib My guess is they'll calibrate that response in such a way as not to create a regional conflagration which I think neither Hezbollah or Iran wants, but I think in many ways, Bibi Netanyahu may want. And so he may keep prodding uh, Iran, poking Iran, baiting Iran uh, in such a way that they're forced to respond uh, with more overwhelming 
uh, kinds of attacks and firepower. And then, of course, we're in really serious trouble. Then we begin to talk about the real possibility of a regional war. Chris Hedges, as always, a pleasure to listen to your wisdom and experience. Thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Well, we're running a poll on will Israel now attack Lebanon? Uh, 26,000 of you have voted. You can vote on my Telegram, on my Twitter, my X, uh, on the YouTube community poll or on the YouTube stream that many of you are watching the show on right now. Quick break, and then it's Samantha in Toronto and Mormon in Dearborn. Stay tuned. On YouTube, Keith Mitchell says, your success in Rochdale has made many, many more than just those who voted for you. As Roger Waters' mum says, do the right thing, George. Keep right with those in Rochdale and they will stand by you at the general election. I want to thank the great Roger Waters for his fulsome support in the contest. I want to thank Low Key, our own considerable genius, for coming to Rochdale and performing so brilliantly, so dazzlingly in the constituency. I want you all to write this down. I was listening today to Low Key's track, Long Live Palestine. And I always knew that it was musically extremely beautiful and inspiring. You know, the one with the chorus, free, free Palestine. But today, for some reason, in a car, I played it and I listened very carefully to the lyrics, which proved to me again that Loki isn't just a recording artist, isn't just an indefatigable activist. He is a professorial political genius. So write it down, long live Palestine. Watch it on Spotify at the end of this show by Loki, L-O-W-K-E-Y. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. North America then in Toronto in Canada is Samantha who wants to talk about Palestine. It's the global university of the airwaves after all. Samantha, welcome. What would you like to say? Hello, Mr. Galloway. Um, I just want to say that I've become involved with the Palestine Solidarity Movement um, since November. Uh, like a lot of people in North America, I was unaware about, about the brutality and degradation and humiliation Palestinians have faced for nearly 76 years by Israel until I did some of my own research back in October and, frankly, every day since. Um, I, intended, I attended my first protest against this genocide in November of 2023. So November 18th was my first protest ever um, about a situation that um, is so at this point so near and dear to me. And I've probably sent probably 500 emails and letters to my so-called leaders about what Israel is doing to the Palestinians. Um, I go to demonstrations every week. So my question is quite simple. What else can I do? It just doesn't feel like enough. Well, it can never feel like enough because we haven't won. Uh, and until we've won, we have to intensify our efforts. I think that we have to uh, continue what we're doing, uh, but do it better. Uh, we need to work in a more unified way. We need to open up new constituencies for this. I mean, it's a truly inspiring story you've just told, that before November you knew nothing, and now, uh, in April, uh, you are a fully committed activist in the cause. So the first thing that uh, I think, as someone whose job is to uh, organize, agitate, and, and educate people uh, is uh, how do we reach other young women like you who haven't yet had this epiphany that you have experienced? 
uh, what is it that we're doing wrong uh, that uh, means that there are lots of other young women like you that we haven't reached yet? Uh, and I go back to the point I was discussing with uh, Professor Simon in Florida and Chris Hedges in the United States. Uh, this whole constituency of Christians in North America in particular, across the Western world, indeed across the world. But uh, why is it that so many Christians not only cannot see the suffering of their co-religionists in the Holy Land where Jesus walked, but that they are supporting the persecution of these people? Now, perhaps with one bound, uh, Tucker Carlson has opened up that whole constituency for us. We certainly have to test that and try. Do you see my point, Samantha? So more unity, more imagination, not staying in our own ghetto, uh, talking to the choir, preaching to the choir, finding new areas of the society that we haven't won yet. Last word to you, Samantha. I just want to say thank you, and um, that's excellent advice. I agree with it. There's so many people that they would be on our side if they just knew more. Perfectly expressed. Samantha in Toronto, thank you very much indeed. Let's go to one of my uh, old uh, hunting grounds, Dearborn in Michigan, where Mormon is on the line. Mormon, welcome. Hello, Mr. Galloway. Honored to talk to you one more time. I wanted to tell you I Thank had you, encountered sir. somebody. Yes, sir. I had encountered somebody in uh, Dearborn that had just returned from Gaza, which is kind of a rare event, but this is the second time that it's happened since the operation started after October 7th. And what he had to say might surprise people because you'd think that there would be a place of despair and just absolute, you know, everybody just giving up and it's just a terrible, but they actually talk about hope and that they think that this is coming to an end. And they talk about some of the signs that they see. They know the date of March 18th. And I said, why? He said, well, that was the day that Canada said they were going to stop sending weapons to Israel, and they thought that was a, a sign that other countries were going to have the courage that uh, Canada did, that, you know, Canada did this, and they woke up the next day, and nobody had smited them down, and they were still there. And uh, he talked about gangs of uh, oddly, you know, young men that roam and look for Hamas. They want to join Hamas. They want to volunteer for Hamas. They, they want to give up their lives because of what's happened to them is kind of sad and you also get a sense that they're turning their eyes towards the United States because of the support this undying support that they're giving Israel you know and it's because they've never attacked the United States they've never harbored any ill intent towards us which seems kind of odd for our even though we've been supporting Israel with this die hard intent for decades They've never actually showed any hatred towards the United States or attacked us in any way. But you get the feeling that that might change. And they talk about uh, in the Haya, the, the ending, they call it the finality, the ending, that this is coming close to. And they, they talk about, he, he talked about that this is uh, some kind of deception, the, the um, ceasefire, the talks that are going on now. He says that there's something going on that they're going to attack maybe in the north or something. Something is happening, but that he doesn't think that this is truly going to be some kind of ceasefire, and that's not how it's going to end, not, not at this time. Well, not, yeah, not it's, like a ceasefire does not look uh, more likely today than it did yesterday, that's uh, for sure, and arguably less likely. I was reading today about the Zionist terror organization, that tried to murder your president, Truman. Uh, Truman was always a reluctant, uh, although brutally uh, uh, effective, uh, partition of, uh, partitioner of Palestine. He really didn't like the Zionists much. He didn't like their attitude much. And he felt that they were seeking to bully and intimidate him, and he pushed back against it. 
and the Zionists tried to assassinate him. They tried to assassinate the president who gave them the decision to partition Palestine, which they promptly then overran those parts that they didn't get in the, uh, in the partition resolution uh, in 1948 before the United Nations. And incidentally, they also tried to assassinate Winston Churchill, another of their supporters, a man who believed in their cause, but insufficiently for the Zionist extremists. Uh, and they, they attempted to murder him also, and did indeed murder one of his cabinet colleagues. Uh, so you say that Palestinians may turn their attention to the United States, so might uh, the extreme Zionist organizations who appear to be willing a civil war in the United States. I see so many videos, read so many articles about their attempt uh, to effectively eliminate what is now a mass movement of millions of people in the US who are increasingly on the side of the Palestinians. You're right, of course, that the uh, possibility now of a ceasefire leading to something meaningful is pretty close to zero. There might be a less meaningful ceasefire, pause, humanitarian break, six to eight weeks, or all these other phrases that Joe Biden stumbles out with. But none of these will lead to the end of the crisis. We need a ceasefire, of course, that's necessary, but it's not sufficient. We need a ceasefire, a complete end to the occupation, the release of all prisoners on both sides, all for all, and a rapid transformation of this state of perpetual war into an imposed international solution whereby the Palestinian state comes into being. Thanks for that uh, call. Now, the Moats podcast is flying this week. It's uh, in all of the previous markets that I've been reporting. It's now in the top 10 in over 25 countries in the world. And it's new this week into the top 10 in South Africa, Singapore, Nigeria, Jamaica, Gambia, and the Cayman Islands. Download it anytime by scanning the QR code on your screen now. Let's take one more call before the break. Sean in Northern Ireland. Go ahead, Sean. Gee, that's George from County Antrim. All right. Okay, it says you? Sean from Northern Ireland, but but you're you're just as welcome. Go ahead. Uh, hello. No, that's us, Sean from Northern Ireland. <laughs> All right. What would you like to say? Yeah, uh, just a couple of points, George. Um, I was wondering if you uh, have ever heard of the Mandela effect. I only ask this because uh, have you ever seen on uh, a Monopoly game the little man, uh, he wears a monocle in one version and in another version nowadays he has no monocle on. Now, I was wondering if the UK and America think that if they keep telling us enough that giving these arms is okay and there's no genocide going on, that in effect will, in the history books, write it out of history in years to come, thus people not knowing the actual history of what is happening now. Another wee point was... Uh, on the Christians in occupied Palestine. Uh, at Easter time, when the Christians recreate the walk from Jesus Christ uh, with the cross up to uh, where he was crucified, the Zionists actually line the way and spit on them and harass them the whole way. So the Christians are as persecuted as the 
Palestinian people in occupied Palestine. Yes, uh, I, uh, first of all, I, I watched uh, Michael Portillo, my former parliamentary colleague, uh, on a, one of his railway journeys on the television last night uh, on the beautiful Antrim coast and the, the causeway uh, and the golf uh, course uh, at uh, Port Rush. And I thought to myself, I must make it to Antrim someday. So uh, good for you living in such a beautiful part uh, of the world. Uh, I think that the notion that the history of the last period is going to somehow be buried or disappear like the monocle on the man in Monopoly. Uh, if they are imagining that, then, then uh, they've got another thing coming. Uh, there's never been more people more aware of the truth of the Palestine question than there is now. You just heard that young woman from, uh, from Toronto. Uh, this is happening in literally millions of cases. New people other uh, hitherto untouched by uh, the realities of this question uh, are flocking to our side. There are demonstrations, protests, boycotts, petitions, every kind of known uh, political activity all over the world taking place all the time. So the Palestinians are firmly in history. They're firmly there. They have refused to go into the museum. They are a live thing. And as long as two of them remain alive, the Palestinian cause will never die. Of that, I'm uh, absolutely sure. So I think it's a forlorn hope, if anyone harbors it, that uh, somehow they're going to be able to excise the realities here. Quite the contrary. Uh, I get the impression that the supporters of Israel now uh, are a rather haunted uh, and ever smaller group of people, most of whom dare not speak their name, dare not speak their cause, because they realize the world has turned comprehensively against it. Uh, I see it on my own social media. I have millions of people follow me on social media, and uh, not a few of them don't like me. So uh, I would normally uh, be expecting a level of visibility of supporters of Israel, which is simply not there now. When they mount a counter-protest, as they did last weekend in London, for example, uh, even though they're subsidizing the people to get there, a pitiful handful of uh, freaks turn out with their Union Jacks and their Israel flags. Uh, and these freaks are including uh, fascists like uh, uh, these uh, far-right organizations that support them, but are supported by virtually nobody in Britain. So it's a freak show, uh, the support for Israel nowadays. And uh, that's because people can see People can feel, and they are seeing, have felt the reality of this, like the, the sun breaking through the clouds. Uh, it'll never be glad, confident morning again for the supporters of Israel. Of that, I'm absolutely certain. Coming up after a short break, it's the Honorable Craig Murray, former British ambassador and key activist in the Julian Assange campaign. Stay tuned. I'll be right back. I defy anyone to contradict the point that I just made that every person alive today was born of woman. So why would we say that the people in the labor wards, in the maternity units, are people who are giving birth. Why can't we say women? Why can't we say mothers? Why can't we say women who are breastfeeding? Mothers who are breastfeeding? Why do we need to say people who are chest feeding? All of these words, and indeed all of the trend that you say you dissociate yourself from, 
of transgenderism, transmania, I call it, are all taking rights away from women. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Well, I very much hope to be sitting in the next British Parliament, whenever the general election comes, with my next guest, not just because uh, he's a good friend of the mother of all talk shows, but because I just know he would be an incredibly effective voice for the people of Blackburn, who he seeks to represent, for the people of Britain, and for the good causes across the world. His erudition, his wit, his skill on his feet, his, uh, his, his background as a British diplomat uh, in the Foreign Office, as an ambassador in Uzbekistan. I think he's going to make it. And so it seems, does the Daily Telegraph, the London Times, and every other right-wing declining, failing, fading rag across the country also seem to be worried about it? because they're writing about him almost as much as they're writing about me. He is the Honourable Craig Murray. Welcome back to the show, Craig. I'll see you on Saturday in Blackburn at the conference we're both uh, addressing. Uh, but let's, uh, before we get on to uh, British political matters, talk about Julian Assange, your friend and mine. Uh, how seriously are you taking uh, the mumbled words uh, of uh, of the doltish uh, U.S. president in the Rose Garden this afternoon. I'm sorry, George, you've actually got me at a disadvantage. I've been actually on a boat all afternoon, <laughs> which I, I got off a few moments ago, so I've not seen it. Well, it's a most splendid uh, way to uh, avoid uh, watching Joe Biden. I uh, <laughs> wish I'd been on a boat this afternoon. But here's what happened. Uh, the Australian government, parliament, uh, asked the US and UK authorities to cease the proceedings against Julian and to set him free. So um, Joe Biden was walking uh, along the Rose Garden path uh, when one of the journalists in the press corps shouted, what's your response to the Australian uh, appeal uh, to drop the charges against Julian Assange. And Joe Biden answered, without looking uh, to the journalist, he answered clearly, volubly enough, but whether or not he was thinking straight remains to be seen. But he answered, we are considering it. So the British news is leading with US considering dropping the charges against Julian Assange. Now, that may turn out to be a false dawn. On the other hand, it may be one of those days where you have to remember that you were on a boat quite oblivious to the news that our friend was about to be freed. Yeah, that would be amazing. Um, it's interesting because Biden has always before stuck to the line that it's up to the Justice Department. It's nothing to do with him. It's nothing to do with the White House. And um, he seems to have that line quite off pat. That seems to have been his remembered response uh, to anything to do with Julian Assange. So that that is a very significant change. Um, I know we, we all know that Biden's no longer fully on top of his mental faculties, so you can't always take anything spontaneous from him as being any more than fumbling for, for a response. But I think that's so different from what's come out of him before um, that it, it must have meaning. And uh, it, it really is very interesting. I've, I've never had any doubt that the Americans don't want him back before the presidential election because it's going to be another big headache for Biden to have the entire media angry over freedom of speech issues if Julian Assange arrives in the United States in chains. Um, so delay, 
as we've continued to see, you know, delay in the process at the High Court and Julian remaining in Belmarsh uh, is what I've been expecting to, to see. Um, and it may be, again, this is simple appeasement while that continues to happen. We, we, we will have to wait and see. I spoke uh, earlier in the show uh, with our colleague Chris Hedges, uh, who speculated that uh, not only that the Americans definitely don't want him back in an election year, uh, they don't want this uh, the optics of a journalist in handcuffs, in chains, uh, coming down uh, aircraft steps. They've got so many problems already, do the Democrats, uh, but that... Uh, it may be that these assurances that the High Court asked the U.S. for were deliberately asked on the basis that the U.S. cannot and will not accept them, will not give those assurances. If that were to come to pass, Julian gets leave to appeal, presumably remaining in the bowels of Belmarsh. If Biden, after consideration of the Australian appeal, effectively drops the charges or drops the most serious of those charges at least, well, we might be partying with Julian as soon as he's fit enough to do so and much sooner than we expected. Well, that would be fantastic. I mean, it's been... 12 years of, of struggle uh, campaigning uh, for Julian, uh, campaigning uh, to get him out first from what was in effect imprisonment in the embassy and then from Belmarsh jail these last five years. Um, and uh, as you know, I'm, I'm very close to Stella and the family and, and seeing the, the toll, the, the human toll it has had on them and on um, Gabriel, his brother, and John, his father, um, you know, has really been uh, very, very tough um, emotionally. Um, so the the notion of him being re reunited with his family uh, would be simply amazing. But I'm not going to get um, too hopeful um, immediately on, on a few words out of the mouth of, of Biden, because there just has been no previous indication. I, and there's been nothing from the Justice Department so far to indicate any easing up uh, from the American side. So this this is entirely new if true, but, uh, but we have to be a bit cautious and wait to see what comes. Now, uh, talking a few words, you've been allowed very few words uh, from some of the media that are growing increasingly interested in your parliamentary bid to come and sit beside me in the House of Commons. Uh, when we're over the target, we experience the flack, of course. <clears throat> but were you surprised at the uh, interest of the, of the national broadsheet uh, media in your imminent candidature in Blackburn? It, it, it's extraordinary. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to say that I think the vast, vast majority of the good people of Blackburn have got far too much sense to pay to read the Times or the Telegraph anyway. So I, I, I don't think it's actually going to reach any of them. But in fact, I was quite flattered by the Times article. The Times article quoted a number of things uh, that I had said, uh, which obviously they expected their readers to be horrified by, but they are things I'm quite proud and happy, I said, in which I stand by today. You know, I said that what happened on the 7th of October was a reaction to 75 years of vicious oppression of the Palestinians by the Israeli state. Uh, and I said that for a single day, the boot had been on the other foot. Um, now, those those statements are simply simply true. I, I, I stand by them. I don't condone random violence against civilians by anyone, but all occupied nations in, in in the all occupied peoples in the, the history of their armed resistance against their occupiers um uh, always end up you know in acts of of armed resistance and that's what we saw on the 7th of october and the the idea that the you know the times thinks it was horrified people that i i i, I state such a plain truth i think is is quite amusing 
Well, the good news is that Rupert Murdoch is uh, turning in record losses. I don't know if you caught up with the News Corp uh, latest uh, figures. Uh, the Sun has lost fifty-four million pounds in one single year, and their uh, um, talk TV outfit, uh, having come off the air, gone on to the internet. Uh, is now sacking some of their biggest names and biggest paychecks. Uh, the the one and only Vanessa Feltz was fired today after her show because they can no longer afford her £800,000 a year salary for a show routinely attracting between ten and 12,000 viewers. Uh, so the Times might not be with us for very much longer, at least not under its present ownership. But doesn't what you just said there illustrate the extent to which these journalists and the politicians, symbiotically living off each other, uh, are living in a, a very small bubble? And what they imagine will have the public clutching their pearls about is actually, quite often, already the a prevailing orthodoxy and the perceived truth and wisdom amongst the great majority of the population. I, I think that's definitely true. And I, I think Gaza has underlined the terrible genocide in Gaza, has um, underlined the distinction between the political and media class and the general population. The fact that the political and media class no longer represent anybody. You know, they have their own very strange set of views, of which ardent Zionism as a kind of membership ticket for entry to the political class is is, is, is one of them, which is simply not shared by the general um, population. And the, the political and media class together are are dependent on, on the billionaires uh, in whose pocket the vast majority of them are. Um, and, and they reflect the views of those billionaires. They don't reflect the views of the general public in any way, and they don't represent the views of the general public in any way, which is why we're seeing this vast wealth gap uh, growing, uh, where you know we are going... The, the Financial Times was saying that within the next five years, the world will have its first trillionaires. And, and at the same time, even in a highly developed economy like the UK, we have children who cannot eat properly. Um, and the, uh, that can only happen in a system where there is no connection between the people and the political class, and the ordinary people have no ability to affect what's happening. That's why we have to smash this two-party system where the only choice people believe they have at elections is between two conservative parties. Now, let me uh, bowl uh, uh, um, an unexpected ball at you. Uh, as you know, I've given up Scottish politics, so I don't raise this for any partisan reason. I have no intention of being involved in Scottish politics again. But the uh, first week of the SNP Green Government's Hate Act, the new hate law, has gotten off to a simply disastrous start, uh, it seems to me. Uh, the people are reporting each other in, in hundreds, if not thousands, of cases. And the police are simply overwhelmed. The police have more or less said they cannot enforce this law. What's your take on that? It's a crazy law. I, I'm, I'm, it always was. It's extremely illiberal. It, um, it specifically states it includes performance, for example. So it includes plays and films and comedy. Uh, it includes the act of communicating uh, hate speech from one person to another person, which could include, for example, if you were to um, give somebody um, a piece of music uh, which contains words that would be defined as hate speech, which would probably include a great many rap songs, for example, would, would probably fall foul of this law. 
uh, the act of giving the music as a Christmas present or whatever uh, would be a crime. And then you have a fact that under Scottish law, anything that can be seen on the internet and read on the internet in Scotland, if read on the internet in Scotland, is deemed to be published in Scotland. So it covers all communications worldwide which are seen in Scotland. Um, so it's no surprise that the police had 8,000 reports in one in one week. It, it, it's a dreadful piece of legislation, which is totally illiberal um, and, and, and really does, I'm afraid to say, uh, reflect the, this dreadful sort of nanny state attitude on, on, on the part of the government in Scotland. Well, uh, I'm actually in Scotland right now. I'm speaking to you in foreign parts on a quayside. Uh, I've got my wood-burning stove on, and I'm speaking freely to you, uh, whether the SNP government likes it or not. So let's hope I don't get the knock on the door. Craig, I'll see you on Saturday, God willing. Go safely. I know you had a little accident. Uh, tell us, uh, how's your shoulder, your arm? Um, progressing less well than I would like. I'm, I'm seeing the surgeon again on on Friday, but it looks like it's going to be uh, another week or two. But there's a huge amount of soft tissue damage. They've got the bones together again, but uh, it's it's all taking some time to heal. Well, we wish you all the best. Hope to see you at the weekend, Craig Murray, Honourable Craig Murray, former British ambassador, prospective parliamentary candidate for the Workers' Party of Britain in the great parliamentary constituency of Blackburn. Thanks for joining us. Will Israel now attack Lebanon? Yes or no? Uh, 27,000 people have now voted. It's a surprisingly uh, nuanced or balanced outcome uh, so far. Right after a short break, I'm going to Indiana to talk with Rashid. Stay tuned. I'll be leading scores of parliamentary candidates and potentially hundreds. Uh, and of course, if they were all to be elected, uh, I might have enough uh, support to become the prime minister. But unfortunately in this country, uh, we don't elect the prime minister directly. If we did, uh, we might be better off. We've got a prime minister for whom nobody at all voted at any level anywhere. He was not even elected by his own members of parliament, but our prime minister is appointed uh, by the king, if he's still there, on the uh, basis that they can command the loyalty, the majority uh, loyalty uh, on the floor of the house, which would be of the order of 325, 326 MPs. Um, it's exceedingly unlikely that that will ever be me. Uh, what I'm concentrating on trying to achieve is that it is not clear who has got the majority of seats, who will be able to form, form a government. In other words, I'm trying to bring about a hung parliament in which people like me, like you, uh, will have some negotiating room, will have some trading room to give our vote 4 p.m. to the person who uh, acknowledges and accepts and is ready to implement some of the key demands that we have, the foremost of which is peace, an end to Britain's role as a perpetual war monger, as the tale of the American war dog. Uh, but there are many other demands that we have also. Uh, I am running to be Prime Minister in the sense that I will be leading a long, long list of Workers' Party parliamentary candidates. And if they were all to be elected, well, then we'd be flying. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Okay, as I said, let's go to Indiana. Why wouldn't we? Where Rashid waits. Rashid, what would you like to talk about? 
Well, I am really speechless to speak to you. You are an angel. I mean, Mr. Galloway, Thank God you. send you basically for a lot of reasons. I mean, you're doing a great job, and I really appreciate you. The world appreciates you, and thank you. But let me tell you, I am a person from Algeria originally. I lived 50 years in the United States. I'm a real citizen, and I lived the war. I know the war, the French war in Algeria, and I was an activist against uh, Vietnam War, against uh, the apartheid state of South Africa, and about Palestine until now. And let me tell you through my experience in my life, and I think the biggest problem in the United States is APAC. APAC is like an octopus with tentacles from everywhere. I mean, from the universities, everywhere, churches, everywhere. And that is the biggest problem why the support, it's a legal bribery and a legal treason in the United States. So to have a foreign nations act, you know, as part of the country and deciding the policies, and that is, you know, the whole problem is APAC. And um, the problem is what the, they come up with this anti-Semitism and the chosen people. The word anti-Semitic is another key for me as an Arab, for me as a child of Ibrahim. You can hate me, that's fine. But if you hate, you know, a Jew or Zionist, oh, you label up an anti-Semitic. Or you, if you say anything, you're anti-Semitic. But the poor Palestinians, either Christians or Muslims, are children of Abraham, children of Isaac, no, of Ishmael. And the cousin Jew are the children of Isaac, Salam Shalom. So the Semitic language was Aramaic, split in Hebrew and Arabic. So, but why is that? You can hate Palestinians. It's okay. But you can't use even the word Zionism you label. And I don't understand how this hypocrisy to call, you know, I think everybody who is anti-Palestinian or any country who is anti-Palestinian is by definition an anti-Semitic. And they're using that as Yeah, well, that's a, great, uh, that's a great irony, uh, Rashid. Uh, thank you for your beautiful words and your powerful call. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, um, it's a trick. They always use it as was said to me by the Israeli government minister, Shulamit Aloni, uh, no longer with us, uh, but for a time, a bright light uh, in the Israeli political firmament. Uh, she gave me dinner in her apartment in Tel Aviv, uh, overlooking the city. I remember very well the twinkling lights and and Yaffa, uh, the port in the distance. She, she gave me dinner and she said to me, actually before she ever said it publicly, maybe I was the guinea pig, she said, it's a trick, we always use it. That is to say, the calling of every criticism of Israel and its conduct as a state, Zionism, uh, on the character of its ideology, uh, call it anti-Semitic. You'll quieten people. You'll marginalize and frighten people. You'll repel people. If you simply brandish, apply the label anti-Semitism to any and all criticism, uh, it's a trick. We always use it, she said. Now, that worked for a very long time and to an extent still works today, particularly in the field of having people no platform, particularly in the field of employment, having people fired or not hired, having students expelled, and uh, not being allowed to graduate, and in that kind of sphere, uh, it still works. Although even there, it is subject to the law of diminishing returns. But amongst the general public, having seen everybody now described as an anti-Semite, including the Pope, 
including Joe Biden last week when it looked like he might be demanding a ceasefire, might be threatening Netanyahu with an arms embargo. Turned out neither of those was true. But when it looked like he was, Joe Biden was called an anti-Semite, a man who's been crawling on his hands and knees for Israel over 50 years in American politics, a man in receipt of $5 million in personal funding from Israel supporting organizations and individuals. Even Biden was called an anti-Semite. Within one hour of Tucker Carlson's uh, interview uh, with the Reverend Munta, one hour, he was deluged with the foul smear that he was an anti-Semite, including from uh, senior former colleagues of his who worked with him for years on Fox News. Bang, they were right on Twitter. You filthy anti-Semite. They were calling Tucker Carlson, for God's sake. So, you know, we have a saying, uh, Rashid. Uh, it's not connected. I'm digressing. But we have a saying, if everybody's first class, nobody's first class. If everybody's an anti-Semite, nobody's an anti-Semite. And that's a really dangerous thing because there are anti-Semites in the lifetime of people who could be watching this show right now, in their lifetime. Anti-Semitism fueled a genocide in which millions of people were massacred, systematically slaughtered with the intention of wiping out every last Jew in the world. There is nothing more mortally dangerous than anti-Semitism. And so if you devalue that word, that charge, if you bankrupt it of all meaning by applying it to everybody you don't like, you're not just harming the people you're falsely accusing, you are endangering Jewish people themselves. How about that? Why don't they think about that? Thanks, Rashid. Now, the Moats podcast will be ready to download tomorrow morning, a compressed version of the full show uh, as is broadcasted. Don't forget, you can download it. You won't have all the commercials, the breaks, the extraneous material will be taken out. You'll get the pure essence of the mother of all talk shows by scanning that QR code on your screen right now. Let's go to London, where Idris wants to talk about the conservative friends of Israel, an even larger group than the Labour friends of Israel. Idris, what would you like to say? First off, I'd like to congratulate you, George, on your by-election win. Thank you. And subsequently, that elimination of that guy leader report, I'm sure, will be taught in media class in the years to come. Put your phone nearer your mouth, Idris. I'm finding difficulty hearing you. Can you hear me now? Hello? Uh, a little better, yes, go on. Can you? My, I've got this LBC the other day. Yeah, we'll have to come back to you, Idris, because something is wrong, I can't, uh, I can't actually hear you. Will Israel now attack Lebanon, yes or no? 27,000 people have now voted. Uh, on Telegram, 78% say yes. On Twitter, 71% yes. YouTube community, 76% yes. YouTube stream, 77% yes. So on Telegram, 22% no. On Twitter, 29% no. On the YouTube community poll, 24% no. And on the YouTube stream, 23% no. Here's some messages. Pro partner Stefan says, Israel doesn't have the balls to attack us in Lebanon. And Anthony Wedgwood 
says Eid Mubarak to all those celebrating, not that those in Gaza can enjoy these celebrations. I'm going to be finishing the show talking about that. Uh, J.R. Leta says, George, greetings from Mexico. I left the U.S. after 20 years of living there, but now it's morally impossible to support the empire. Uh, Danny Delaney says, the biggest mistake I made regarding Israel was to let my heart rule my head. I feel completely fooled and let down by them. And in my mind, Travag says, Gazans are being charged between eight and 10,000 US dollars to get out of Gaza. Egypt is involved in this atrocity. Let's go back to Toronto on Jonas, uh, where Jonas wants to talk about Egypt. Go ahead, Jonas. Hello, George. Lovely to speak with you. Um, yes. Thank so you. I'm wondering. Yes, thank you. Um, the question is about uh, about Egypt and uh, General Sisi. And uh, I remember you saying that they could just be throwing the food over the uh, over the gate, as it were. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm wondering your thoughts on on why that's not happening. Uh, well, Egypt is a puppet uh, state uh, of the United States and Israel, and uh, it gives me no pleasure at all to say that, not least because I've just got myself banned again from Egypt by saying it. Uh, but uh, there's no other way you can describe it, that Egypt, the beating heart of the Arab world, the greatest Arab country, the biggest Arab country, uh, with all its... Uh, millennia of civilization should be reduced in circumstance to being a slave of the American empire and its attack dog. Israel is a matter of uh, grievous uh, upset to me. Uh, if I could, I'd live in Cairo. I love Egypt. I love Cairo. I love the Egyptian people. I love Gamal Abdel Nasser. I love the great victories of the, uh, the Egyptian armed forces in 1973 when they took back their territory from the Zionist state. I love everything about Egypt, including its food, its music, its culture, the view of the Nile from the hotel balconies in downtown Cairo. I miss them so much. So it gives me zero pleasure to say uh, that if Egypt wanted to open that gate and drive the aid through in the thousands of trucks that Chris Hedges talked about earlier, uh, they could do so. They've got the key. They just have to turn it. Uh, even if they didn't want to turn it, they could catapult it over the wall and the Palestinians could then distribute it themselves. It is a truly shameful, melancholy truth that, uh, that Egypt is ruled by a puppet regime. And I dream of the day when the Egyptian people can be great again. Torwin says, the only reason I think Israel will attack Lebanon is because Netanyahu has no other choice. He is desperate to cling to power so he doesn't go to prison and has to widen the war. He's also a maniac, says Torwin. And Anthony Wedgwood said, Nice to see Moat's legend Erobos on the Galloway show this week. He speaks so eloquently. We need to give him British citizenship and have him running for the Workers' Party. Uh, Anthony is referring to my new show, Have It Out with Galloway. You can see it now. It's on YouTube now. Uh, and uh, I think you'll like it. The guests were Miko Peled, uh, the great Israeli-American, and uh, Dr. Mustafa Barghouti, the great Palestinian legislator, legislator and sage. Uh, and amongst the guests on the video wall, that's a big development, this uh, video wall. Uh, it's taken quite a long time, months, uh, to put it together. But we've got it now, thanks to Gayatri. And there it is. There's a video wall with people calling in. And guess who was on from New York, but the legend Erobos. And so many people have said they were so happy to see him. He doesn't just have 
uh, that wonderful voice. He has a real aura and presence when you see him in person. Let's go to Crawley in England, where Jason wants to talk about Palestine. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, there's there's a couple of things I want to say. I, I want to say that you're a very, very brave man because you're always putting yourself on the front line. And do you fear for your life? I mean, because, you know, with all these assassination attempts, people ending up in prison like uh, Julian Assange for no, for no reason. And um, and with what's going on in 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 Gaza is absolutely disgusting because I come from a mixed family. My um, father was a Muslim. My mother was a Christian. Our family's quite dynamic. My brother-in-law's a Christian um, Palestinian who was kicked. Their family were kicked out of northern Israel in 1948. And so those are the type of things I just wanted to make a comment on. And and also that that. Um, the risk to yourself by putting yourself so far in the front line. Well, here I stand. I can do no other, uh, Jason. My conscience, which is my daily communion with God, would not permit me to remain silent, uh, still less, God forbid, to say things I didn't believe in. Uh, so I cannot remain silent. I must speak what I believe to be the truth, and I must face whatever consequences there are. As it happens, maybe it's a freak of nature, but I'm not, uh, I have never been, all, all of my life I have never been afraid of anything, of anybody or anything. I'm afraid only of God. I'm afraid only of the judgment day uh, and failing to pass muster uh, as a result of uh, the sins uh, that I have committed uh, over what is now quite a decently long life. So uh, that's my only fear, that I, I might not make the cut into heaven. Uh, if they assassinate me, I'll go straight to heaven. So uh, uh, I'm not at all afraid of them. Uh, of course, I take precautions, trust in God, but tie up your camel. Uh, and uh, I have uh, many precautions and many means by which uh, I can answer any attack on me and uh, I now as a member of parliament have a, a level of protection which is greater than before so it wouldn't be easy uh, for them to uh, reach me for them to uh, assassinate me as you uh, put it but if they did well I am ready uh, I can do no other than speak what I believe to be the truth thanks Jason for your concern. Jack Plugman, great name, says Chris Hedges' speech ending about how we let down the kids of Palestine was beautiful. Amen to that, Jack. Cam 35mm says Tucker is an opportunist. Wet fingers always in the wind. At least sometimes he gets it right. I don't go along with that, to be honest, but there's not enough time left in the show uh, to uh, elaborate. Che Guava says the media didn't fail to do their job over Assange. They deliberately chose not to. Well, let's go for the live social media roundup to my good wife, Gayatri. What's rattling, Gayatri? Well, the poll this week is not as straightforward as usual. Will Israel attack Lebanon now? Um, whilst most of the people are answered yes, there were lots of arguments saying no, because obviously by attacking Lebanon, they will involve Sy um, Iran. And that's, of course, probably the whole reason. Monica Reigns says, I'm reminded of General Wesley Clark's interview right after 9-11, where he shared the seven countries in five year scenario from the Pentagon. Lebanon was on that list, as well as Iran, the biggest prize. So my answer is sadly yes. As long as the US sends the weapons and the dollars, they will attack so as to create their dream of the Greater Israel Project, as reiterated by Netanyahu last fall at the UN. And Vince Jones says, we have to remember that Israel's nuclear arsenal is available to Netanyahu and the other members of the Knesset. The Israelis, with their backs to the wall, are capable of horrific and reckless acts as we are seeing now in Palestine. We need some adults to come forward like Putin or Xi Jinping, not Biden, and mediate the situation, or they may turn our lovely world into a flame. 
And um, uh, finally, well, no Gordon doubt Lamont. about that, is there? Uh, if, if, if somebody doesn't put a halt to this, it might slide out of control, spreading far and wide and involving, in the end, everybody. Yes, the risk is real. And therefore, will they go ahead? Is that what they want or not? That's, of course, the real question and um, the discussion uh, in response to the poll. Now, what about this, I don't then? believe that's uh, what they want. Uh, but if they don't want it, they best act fast to stop it from happening. In response to today's guest, I don't believe Matthew the British, Watt French, American leaders want uh, a war stretching from the Persian Gulf. I mean, let's just take one example, Gayatri. If Iran closes the state of Hormuz, you will not be able to buy a gallon of petrol for 50 pounds a gallon. Just like that, in an instant. No more Straits of Hormuz means an exponential rise in the price of fuel, bringing down governments, closing down industries, closing down workplaces, making normal life completely impossible. Just one act of Iran closing the Straits. If Iran was to bombard America's allies in the Persian Gulf, their oil production would be finished. It would be literally obliterated by missile fire. Places like Dubai would no longer exist. All their towers in the sky would come tumbling down. I don't believe that the Western countries want that or are ready for that. But if they don't act, that might be what they get. Scary thought, that scary thought. Um, I've got an email here from Greg Douglas. He says, George, good luck with your campaigning. I left the Labour Party just before I was expelled. I am an anti-Zionist Jew, and I'm furious at the UK Jewish establishment report that the pro-Palestine protests in UK do not include Jewish people like myself. In fact, there is a large Jewish bloc participating, and I wrote that to that rag, the Jewish Chronicle, to decry its reporting. So I was delighted to see the video by Miriam Margols supporting the Australian Council of Jews protest at the Gaza genocide. I am proud to see a fellow Anglo-Australian Jew make such a strong principled declaration, which of course has been described as a fascist speech by that shameful Dame Maureen Lipman. However, uh, Miriam stresses uh, Jewish tradition that we should do unto others as we should wish them to do to us in solidarity. Well, that's a very beautiful you. message, as was Miriam Margoles' uh, video. Uh, if you haven't seen that, everyone should look at it. And it is very important. It links to uh, a point I was making earlier in the show in response to uh, another call that, look, many Jews are not Zionists, and most Zionists are not Jews. Our opposition is to a political ideology, just as you could be anti-Bolshevik but love Russia, indeed most of them claim to, just as you could be anti-Nazi uh, but love Germany, as you could be anti-apartheid but love South Africa, we must resist the synonym that Jew equals Zionist, that right. Jewishness equals Israeliness. Israel is a state. States are here today, gone tomorrow. Who remembers uh, Czechoslovakia? Anyone? Anyone remember the Schleswig Holstein question? States come and go because they either fit the circumstances of the time and the wishes of the people of the time, or they don't. And when they don't, they no longer exist. So our opposition is to Zionism, not to Jews or Judaism at all. Last one yes, from you. And otherwise you get these scenarios in which everyone criticizing Israel is, of course, anti-Semitic, including Joe Biden, as you said earlier. <laughs> yeah including Joe Biden, including that Jewish uh, correspondent whose uh, message you just read out 
including Miriam, yep. including all <laughs> these great Jewish figures, some of the finest, bravest people in the world, they're anti-Semites too, even though they're Jewish. This has gone far enough. It's gone far enough. Far into enough. absurdity. And it's, it's far okay. enough. Sorry, it's I, far I enough. know you should never tell your wife she's got a last <laughs> point to make. But if you do have uh, a lost, last point to yeah, make, Yeah, well, let, let me get it closer it. to home as you're in Scotland now. This is from Moira. Always great to watch you on the moats. S.A. Pfeiffer done firm line. I feel like, uh, I feel a strong affiliation to you. Such a change to have a Scotsman, usually the poor relation to the UK, promoting and supporting so many good and worthwhile causes. You always remind us of your Irish background. Please do not forget your Scottish background too. We need you very much. Thank you again for filling the void. Very beautiful, Mara. Uh, very beautiful. Yeah, and I'm glad you made that point. Uh, I am exactly, because I've done the DNA test, I am exactly 50% <laughs> Irish and exactly 50% Scottish. And I'll always be. And uh, my children have inherited uh, not just the Scottish genes, but as you were born and brought up in the Netherlands, you know all about going Dutch. Our children, <laughs> like you, and like all Scots, are very, very careful with money, if you get my drift. Imagine a marriage between someone from the land of going Dutch and someone from Scotland. Thank you very much indeed. Gayatri, I'll see you after the show. Uh, let me take uh, two quick calls. One from Sarkar, a legend in Glasgow, and the last from Norma, the legend in Bristol. Sarkar first. Go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you so much, George. George, uh, keep going with the show, even if you retire for politics. That's my humble request. Uh, George, it's a thank very you. serious question. Uh, see, I don't know why the British media have not been very vocal about this. A few days ago, the Kosovan Prime Minister... I personally believe Kosovo is a very important part of Serbia, no matter how much the West try and separate that through their means, machinations. It's almost 30 years for the bombing of Yugoslavia. We know what happened, that illegitimate bombing by NATO. The Kosovo Prime Minister a few days ago said we need more British, British troops to save us from a Serbian invasion. I emphasize on the word more. Does that mean our British troops are already there over there? I don't know, George, what's this yeah, obsession with uh, trying to always decimate Serbia? Have they not had enough of bloodlust after decimating Yugoslavia? I'd like to hear your views, George. They hate Serbia. Uh, I once read a poem. I cut it out and put it on my wall when I was very young. Uh, I just remember one couplet from it. Some men hate a crab because it runs sideways, not straight. They chase it madly along the beach with a stick. And I always think of Serbia when I think of that couplet. They hate Serbia for reasons which they are actually incapable of, uh, of enunciating because it is entirely irrational, illogical, to hate Serbia in the way that they do. But if you're looking for a reason, they hate Serbia because it runs sideways, not straight. It's its own man. It's its own woman. The Serbian people are their own people. They believe in themselves. They believe in their religion. They're proud of their culture. They're proud of their society. And they don't take orders from uh, these Western regimes that are desperate to push them uh, into hatred of Russia. Serbia will never hate Russia. They'll always love Russia. Because Russia always stood by them, even in their darkest hour that you just described 30 years ago. Last call is from the legend that is Norma in Bristol. Go ahead, Norma. Hello, George. Um, a bit of a lighter note. Um, I noticed you put this lovely picture of Paul Robeson on the earlier today. And he was a terrific hero of mine. He was born um, on April the 9th, so it's, it's topical on 1898, I think. But um, he was yeah. no, he should never be forgotten, George. I mean, his skills were huge. His voice was just 
marvelous. And he was, he, you know, he was in, in Shakespeare. He was in Othello in London. But of course, he couldn't go back to his hotel through the front door. He had to go through the back door because he was black. But you see, the thing I wanted to say was, because I, I, I actually saw him in concert in Bristol, and I visited um, in Harlem, where he had a little house on Sugar Hill a long time ago when I went to America. And um, it was amazing, but his voice, and Joe Hill, when I hear that, it just stirs me to tears. So I want to, he was in your Hall of Fame, I know, but... Um, Never to be forgotten, George. He was Never. the first, I think he was the first person in our Hall of Fame, if I'm not mistaken. A beautiful call from you. I'm glad you're back on the show, Norma, and a very beautiful and typically generous call uh, for you to make. Uh, Paul Robeson was born more or less uh, on this day, probably yesterday, uh, in 1898. And for those who don't know him, which is a surprisingly large number of people. You really should study uh, more about him. He was the voice of God before Pavarotti. Uh, he had a voice like no other. He was taller than almost anyone on the planet. He, he, he was such an athlete that he became the first black uh, American football player uh, at a national level. He, uh, he was an actor of Shakespearean brilliance. He was a film star. He was, a, he was bigger than the Beatles in his day. And he lost it all because he stood up for peace and against war, because he refused to kowtow to the prevailing power in the United States. He loved the Soviet Union. He loved China. He loved Africa. He spoke more languages than you'd think it was possible for anyone to uh, be able to speak. He could speak, write, and read in 30, 40, 50 languages fluently, could sing in those languages. This was a rare genius, a pure diamond, a diamond individual was Paul Robeson. And he ended his life in isolation and penury. They took his passport away. They wouldn't allow him to perform in public. They wouldn't allow him to speak in public. He was no platformed. He was shunned and sidelined but he will forever, for you and me, Norma, be one of the greatest heroes of our time. Thank you for making that call, and thank you uh, for watching this show, which sadly now must come to an end. I wish every faithful Muslim watching this show, hearing this message, Eid Mubarak, Happy Eid, May God accept your fast, but I beg you, Muslim and non-Muslim, not to forget that the Palestinian people, particularly in Gaza, but elsewhere too, are this evening in their tents, having bombs, rockets, and shells tear them and their children apart. They're not fasting today, they're just starving. If you think that we can sleep peacefully without thinking of them, I think you're making a mistake. It's the mother of all talk shows.